Okay, so you've had a busy day already and you've heard a, a lot of important, about a lot of important matters. I want to talk to you about something very important, which is the integrity of your research. So, what do I mean by that? What is research integrity? Um, it's essentially the trustworthiness of your research due to the soundness of its methods and the honesty and accuracy of its presentation. And this definition um, of research integrity was one that was deliberated and decided on at uh, the Second World Conference on Research Integrity in 2010. And this is where a group of scientists, researchers, journal editors, politicians, um, managers of media, outlets, government funding agencies, all got together to come up with a set of principles and professional responsibilities that are just absolutely fundamental to integrity of research wherever it's undertaken in the world. So it was a, a major step forward um, across the world, a major step forward toward promoting ethical conduct between researchers. And it's important to the university environment which relies on academic freedom. So this is the foundation of, of any university and it's the right to put forward a position and then have that position openly debated. And the principles of academic freedom, they're only going to hold true if, if researchers, if we all act with a high degree of integrity. So it's important for a host of reasons. Firstly, the public perception of research. Um, our research needs to be voracious, transparent, um, and unwavering or we're going to lose credibility. And some examples that we can probably draw on are in the climate change um, arena, probably closer to 10 to 20 years ago, when there were small discrepancies in science or in research that media outlets really grabbed onto. Um, they can affect the whole scientific discipline in a major way. So we also often conduct research that have really important health and safety implications, our research, the outcomes of our research could adversely affect um, people's lives, uh, especially if we get something wrong along the way. Our funds won't be available to us if we don't hold um, our research to the highest standard. And lastly, because research affects the community, social welfare, um, can affect animals and the environment, it's often subject to legislation and policies. And we need to be aware of those policies to conduct and to plan our research. And any fraudulent behaviour um, that undermines or goes against these policies, it can therefore be the subject of criminal investigation in the future. And another important point is that the integrity of our research, it's going to affect the value of our degree. So if we want to be employable um, and we want people to recognise or other academics to recognise our PhD when we graduate, we need to make sure that we all um, act professionally to uphold the reliability of our degrees and the reliability of the, the university. So you can see from these headlines Unfortunately, it's not just common sense. People do the wrong thing occasionally. We can't just rely on people always acting and behaving ethically. And our research is open to scrutiny. So across the world, there were scandals of research, um, fraudulent behavior, I guess. And that led to codes and policies being developed that outline rules and procedures that we all need to abide by. I've just got a little question. Has anyone, do, was anyone aware that we have a code of conduct for responsible research practice? Yep, maybe some of you were through the Masters of Research or you've heard about it at another institution. I'm just going to focus a little bit about the Australian Code and the Macquarie Code and my colleague will focus on animal ethics and human ethics approval processes. Okay, so 
These were designed to guide institutions and researchers in responsible research practices. They're designed to promote integrity in research and explain generally what's expected of you um, as researchers and what's expected of the institution. So what Macquarie's obligations are to you and what the supervisor's obligations are to you and what you need to do for us. So they also provide advice to researchers and staff that are responsible for managing departures from the code or departures from best practice. The codes apply to all researchers. The Australian Code applies to all researchers in Australia, no matter where the research is undertaken, so in a government agency, in a, in a private industry environment, or at an academic institution. And the Macquarie Code, likewise, applies to researchers at Macquarie. It's not dependent on your status as a student, staff, or high degree research candidate, and it also applies to volunteers that may be coming on board on your research. So not a lot of time um, to go through in detail, but you do all have homework, which is to read. Sorry, it's like school. You have to read this code, please. <laughs> I'll probably be seeing many of you at faculty commencement programs, um, and I'll give you some more information on um, aspects of the code. I'll probably be asking you have you read this? I'll be testing you. Okay, so the general principles that are encompassed, we've already touched on. So we need to conduct ourselves ethically with integrity and professionalism. We need to follow all policies, regulations and laws. And you've heard today mention of a lot of policies that relate to your research. This has a list of them and draws together a lot of those policies into best practice guidelines. So it really is a good place to start. Okay, we need to respect the environment, animals and research participants. And lastly, we need to acknowledge the responsibilities we have when we're working with groups of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. The practices that are outlined in the code um, some of these you've touched on. For example, you just heard a little bit from Nick about the peer review process and publication process. I'm only going to give you a key point about each of these areas, but they're more detailed in the code. So in general, management of data and materials. Generally, your data needs to be maintained for five years post-publication. So it needs to be in a format that's accessible and transparent and that's the minimum. You may have animal ethics or human ethics requirements um, or legislative or funding agency requirements that demand you to hold the data for longer. So um, you need to be aware of that. You've heard a little bit about publication, dissemination and authorship matters. And dissemination, that includes um, publishing any results. So it could be on a web page, in a media um, report, uh, on a blog, on your Facebook page, um, and refers to journal authorship as well. So one of the most important things in this area is that the work needs to be accurate and it needs to contain full declaration of funding sources and a full acknowledgement of everyone who's participated or contributed to that work. In the code, we give guidelines on how um, or what does and doesn't warrant authorship in a publication. And I really stress, I'd like you to read the code, um, but in a nutshell, to be listed as an author on a paper, you need to contribute significantly in three areas. That includes conceiving and designing um, the work, analysing and interpreting the work, and lastly, writing or critically revising the manuscript. Okay, so the code also describes details about what doesn't um, entitle authorship, and that might be things like just providing materials um, or just providing funding for the work. Okay, there are scientific um, cultures, I guess, differences between scientific disciplines that you might need to familiarise yourself with as well. And I encourage you to do this 
um, by seeking a mentor if you're unsure. So in the peer review process, we've heard about what that means when you send your manuscript to peer review, but you may also be requested to participate in this process. Um, a journal editor might seek you, your assistance. So you need to conduct yourself ethically. If you don't think you're the right person or you're knowledgeable enough to report on that work, just recluse yourself from that situation and politely decline. Or you could seek your supervisor's assistance to go forward with that and a bit of training about how to conduct a peer review process. Okay, collaborative research. So when you're working with people at other organisations or um, institutions, there needs to be a formal agreement. Um, your supervisor will hopefully have set this up, um, and if not, um, that should be a little flag for you to make sure that there's some kind of agreement in place that includes these details. So ownership of IP, um, who's responsible for the data, who's going to maintain the data, if there's any confidentiality issues about when you can publish that data. Um, what else? It could also include a publication plan that everyone is in, a, in agreement with early on. Um, and lastly, conflict of interest. If you're working with researchers at, at other institutions, it's important that you all declare any perceived or actual conflict of interest in the work. Um, and the code goes into some further details on what might constitute a conflict of interest. Um, it's in a research context, it doesn't have to be an actual conflict of interest that exists. If someone from outside of your team is looking on and thinks there's a conflict of interest, you need to declare and manage that as if there is one. And finally, as I said to you before, we have obligations to you and supervisors also have obligations and these are in part detailed in the code, um, which again refers to higher degree research supervision guidelines. Okay, so I think I've told you your first task, which I will be testing on shortly. Read your code and make sure you're familiar with it. Um, it's something that you might go back to multiple times throughout your journey. Um, and some of it might not make sense or seem relevant at the first time you look at it. You've heard a lot today, so I'll give you a couple of weeks before I see you again. Um, but please have a read. Talk about any issues with your supervisor that you don't understand. This includes discussing data management arrangements. At the set out, just plan to be meticulous with your records. It's going to make things super easy for you at the end. It might take an extra 20 minutes a day, and some days that will seem impossible. But um, being meticulous with your records will pay off, and it's depicted in the code. So talk about authorship, participate in planning authorship, and keep records of your discussions. They don't have to be formal templates or guidelines, although that would help. They could just be an informal email um, to your other team members about a chat you just had about you know, what publications you see coming out of your research and who's going to participate in those. Okay, relating to any work being published um, that is your own work, you need to understand plagiarism. And if you don't at this stage, you need to very quickly obtain some training. And um, that might be through the library in the first instance. Ask for training and peer review if you want to um, participate in this process. Discuss any conflicts of interest and how to manage them. Meet regularly with your supervisor and seek other help to, to manage your pressures. Okay, you're going to be under pressure from um, things external to the university that might be affecting your research practices. Okay, you need to effectively manage them so that you can focus on your work and there is help available at the university to do this. So if things aren't going well, raise it with a mentor or a supervisor and it's best to raise it early. Don't um, delay a difficult conversation. It's just going to make things more difficult in the long run. Um, 
you can seek a mentor to help you if, if you are putting off a difficult conversation and you don't know how to negotiate a relationship issue or a, a difficult um, research dilemma. Okay, so part of the, the role of our office, the Research Integrity Office, is to let you know about the code, but our role is also to manage investigations into breaches of the code or research misconduct. I just want to talk to you briefly about what this involves. A breach is simply, a f well not simply, but it's a failure to comply with the Macquarie Code or a policy that's outlined in the code. And research misconduct involves an alleged breach of the code, intent and deliberation, serious consequences, and some examples might be fabrication of data, falsification of reports, um, plagiarism or deception. Failure to declare or manage a conflict of interest where one exists. Failure to follow research proposals as approved by research ethics committees, whether it be animal or human, or um, biosafety protocols. Willful concealment or facilitation of research misconduct. So in the unlikely event that you see a practice or something gone awry in someone else's research and you feel you need to make a report, um, they're made out to the Director of Research Ethics and Integrity at that address. And on the topic, that we also have research integrity advisors at Macquarie, and you've met some of these people already. They are the Associate Deans of Higher Degree Research and the Associate Deans of Research in each faculty. And they are our network of advisors in research integrity. They can provide advice on good research practice and advice about reporting breaches of the code. If you have a concern, you can have a chat to one of the research integrity advisors. They don't have to be the one in your faculty. You can go to any of them. Um, you can talk in hypotheticals. You don't have to give specifics. You can just get some general advice and help um, about your research or if you feel like you need to prepare a complaint. Okay, I'll just leave you with some other sources of information that you can follow up with. And you've got some sites, some websites to follow up in your little postcard. So thank you. Um, leave it there. Hi everyone, congratulations on starting your research program. It's really exciting. Um, it can be a really, really exciting few years. Um, my name's Rebecca Tennant. I'm from the Research Ethics Office. We're over in Wally's Walk and we do have a fairly open office environment. So if you would like to drop in and get some advice, you're more than welcome to. We don't have a lot of time to talk about the specifics of ethics today, so I'm just going to give you an overview and um, hopefully you'll leave today with an idea of whether or not you do need ethics approval as part of your um, project and where you can go to, to start and get that process um, moving. Research ethics basically um, has come out of some morally abhorrent research that was conducted um, by scientists on prisoners in both Europe and Japan that we're probably all pretty familiar with. Um, in 1947, um, the legal review of, of what happened during that period of time um, sought to establish some a code around um, research ethics. And in 1947, the Nuremberg Code was developed. It's, um, it remains the, one of the core backbones, I suppose, of um, research ethics today. Um, I will put a little disclaimer in here. I'm um, from human ethics. There is human ethics and animal ethics. I will give you an overview of animal ethics today or um, tell you in which cases you might need to obtain animal ethics advice. Um, but um, there are other people in our office that are specialists in that area. Um, the core, at the core of ethical research and responsible research is a balancing, I suppose, of the benefits of the risks and potential harms um, from doing the research um, and the protection of participants against the advancement of knowledge and the attainment of potentially significant social and individual benefits. So in terms of an ethics committee looking at your work and trying to work out whether it's ethical, there's a, a balance, I suppose, between those, those two areas. Um, and they're particularly interested in the protection of vulnerable parties. Um, that's not necessarily limited to research participants. It can also be people that are observing the research um, and so on. And it is humans and animals. So I'm not sure how many of you will be 
doing work with animals, but it does include um, any animals that are used as part of your research. Um, research ethics, um, the human component of research ethics um, is um, overseen, I suppose, or, or we, we refer to the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research, which, was, which is hosted by the National Health and Medical Research Council. Um, that statement basically outlines how it is that we look at research, what it is that we balance up, and how we go about some of the practical components, so how an ethics committee works and what it is that we need to we need you to do and what we need to do to make sure that um, we're meeting our requirements. Um, at Macquarie, there's also um, a Macquarie code for ethical conduct, and I would um, suggest that you go to Policy Central and, and familiarise yourself with that. It reflects what's in the national statement, but at an organisational level. Um, at Macquarie, we've got um, two central ethics committees. So we have one that predominantly looks at humanities research um, and one that looks at medical and health sciences research. And each of the faculties also have um, a low-risk uh, research subcommittee. Um, the central committees meet 10 times a year, so about once a month, um, and the faculties have a, a running review typically. There is a cutoff date for applications. It's typically a couple of weeks before the meeting, but if you have a look at our website, um, you can see each meeting date and the cutoff date that you need to submit by. Um, animal ethics is governed by the Australian Code for the care and use of animals for scientific purposes, and there's also an animal ethics committee. They also meet 10 times a year, and um, you can access their meeting dates and information about that committee from our website as well. So in terms of the responsibilities to human research participants, if you are doing any research that um, involves humans, including watching them, using any of their samples, including their exhaled breath or their data, if you're looking at anything on social media, that's, that's their data, um, you do need to apply for human research ethics. Um, and I would encourage you to think about that quite early in the process. So most of you probably have a rough idea of what your project will entail and, and whether you will be involving humans. I encourage you to start and get information at this point um, about the ethics approval process. So as I said, we, um, we do review applications. We look at the research merit and integrity. Shannon talked a little bit about integrity and what that entails. Um, we look at justice, so we're particularly interested in um, how you're recruiting people into your study and whether or not they'll access any benefits, and that's particularly relevant for um, any medical research. Um, the benefit has to um, outweigh the risks, and we're particularly interested in um, respect for human beings. Um, the link is here for the national statement, um, and I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, in terms of animal research ethics, um, any work with animals has to be approved by the Animal Ethics Committee. And for both human and animal ethics, that means before you start your research. So you need to have your ethics squared away before you start and do anything. Um, in terms of principles of working with animals, the so three R's um, hold replacement. So you should try to come up with a method that um, avoids using animals to start with. Um, you should. Um, you should eke out methods that minimise the number of animals used, and then if you do need to use animals, you should minimise the pain, suffering, distress, or, or lasting harm to the animals of your research. In terms of your responsibilities as, um, as researchers, you need to follow the standards that exist um, for both animal and human ethics. You need to get training for human ethics. We, um, we do actually run training sessions and the dates are available on the human ethics website. I think it's four times a year. I, I think the next one is around um, mid to the end of March. Um, you don't need to RSVP for those, so you can just show up. It's a one-hour session, and it's quite an informal session where you, you would have the opportunity to talk about your specific research projects. There's also research ethics advisors in each faculty. Um, they typically have a good knowledge of the types of research in your faculty, but there's also specialist advisors for areas that require a bit of um, specialist expertise. So, for example, if you're doing work with Indigenous participants, we have someone that does a lot of work in that area, not necessarily in your faculty, but um, we can provide you with names if you need expert um, advice. Um, we also try to promote a sort of a, a fairly um, open, drop-in, phone call kind of situation. So pick up the phone and call um, the ethics office if you're not sure if you need ethics approval or if you have specific questions about it, um, your application. 
It's also the role of your supervisor to provide you with a bit of guidance in that and your supervisor in putting together an ethics application is actually the chief investigator. So you're, you're um, an associate investigator or you're attached to the project but you're not the primary um, applicant. So your supervisor does need to be involved in that process with you and they will need to s sign off and submit the application. In terms of the application process itself, I will flag that it's going to change this year from, from this process. Um, at the moment, if you go onto our website, you can download a form. As I said, work with your supervisor to put the form together um, and submit it prior to the cutoff date for the meeting. Um, it's probably worth thinking that it's going to take you at least a month to get ethics approval. So if you want to start your research, in it, you know, if you want to start talking to participants or observing them or somehow engaging with them, you need to give yourself at least a month um, and that's presuming that, you're, that there's no questions around your application or no feedback required from you back to the committee. Um, if you email it to the Ethics Secretariat, it'll be submitted and reviewed. Um, when the committee is satisfied with the application, um, they will approve it. Um, and then you can go and do your research. The only time that we need to hear from you after that is an annual report each year. Um, and if you make any changes to, to what you've said you're actually going to do, you need to submit a, an amendment. Um, the take home message I guess at this point is think about now whether or not you need ethics um, approval. And if you do, start um, looking into it, um, trying to work out what it is that you're actually doing look at the application process, talk to your supervisor um, and maybe get in touch with us if you have quite a complex research project. Um, you do need to be aware of the relevant regulation and legislation, that's your responsibility as students. Um, it's not just about meeting the regulatory or legal requirements but it is a continuous reflective process so as you're going through your project think to yourself, does your research project undermine or does it reinforce the values that are inherent in the national statement? Um, are you conducting, um, are you engaging in an ethical way with the people that you're engaging with? And as Shannon said, if you do have a bad feeling or you feel uncomfortable, do talk to someone else. Um, there are um, research ethics advisors, your supervisor is a good first start. Um, there's the human ethics um, office, animal ethics if that's relevant for you and, and multiple other mentors and so on that you can talk to about ethics. Um, I will just um, update the website that's in this presentation. We do have, we've gone from having four or five entry points into our website to one. So if you add a website that's asking you to log in, that's, the old, that's an old website. You don't need to log in to get information off our website. So please make sure you're in the right place. Does anyone have any questions? Good, good luck with your